Mark chapter 14. Hallelujah. The ladies in the kitchen, where are the kitchen help? Where's the kitchen helpers? You ladies do miracles, amen. Praise the Lord. This is a wonderful, wonderful place, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for your work. And you do it with a smile. I see the ladies running here, running there, and hallelujah, praise the Lord, glory to God. They're all happy, amen. That's the way God wants his workers to be. Praise the Lord, amen. Praise God. Well, I enjoy here because I love this place and I love these people, amen. But I especially am happy to be here in this meeting this week because it is a missionary convention, or amen. And I love uh, missions. I love the work of God. Every, I've told the local people before, when I was 17 years old, God spoke to my heart and called me to be a missionary. Amen. I never wanted to do anything else. That's all I wanted to do was to be a missionary when God called me. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I like what God's doing. And because I am a missionary, because I love missions, I love to read and to preach from the book of Acts. Amen. Acts is a history book about missionary activity and missionary work and labor, amen. And so tonight, I'm not going to preach from the book of Acts, even though I really like it, amen. But I feel like God has given me something to share with you, and I recognize that I desperately need his help if I'm going to be able to help you and speak something of value to you, amen. Now, apart from Jesus, my favorite character in all of the New Testament is always the Apostle Paul, amen. That great, powerful missionary. He was a master missionary, amen. I, pr I love to read about Paul, but as great as Paul was, he's not the man I'm going to preach to you about tonight, amen. I think there's actually one greater missionary than the Apostle Paul. You may be looking, where is that missionary? Help me find that missionary. Amen. Well, you all know him. I'm sure of that. Praise the Lord. Let's look in Mark chapter 14, verse number 32. If you would stand, please. Amen. Pastor Mejia has said how that he struggles with time. I do too. Amen. Not only do I struggle with going too long, but I struggle with talking too fast and nobody can understand anything that I'm saying. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So I have earnestly prayed today that the Lord would help me to slow down. Because if you don't understand, how will you receive anything from the Lord? So if our translators up there will say, I will try to remember to slow down. Amen. Mark chapter number 14, verse number 32. We're going to read in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Listen carefully to these first few words. And they came to a place. Wait right there. Just so calm, just they came to a place. How many of you have come to a place before? No, 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 no. I don't mean how many of you have gone to a place. I go to a place. My wife is short and she's very, walks very slowly and I'm, I'm not tall, but I walk fast everywhere. Amen. And she says, Brother Carlos, wait, stop. Amen. But I'm trying to get to a place. I want to be there. But that's not what happened here. They came. It means their journey began a long time ago. And after many surprises, many twists, many turns in life, 
many experiences, they finally arrived at this place that God had always wanted them to come to. They came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he saith to his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy and saith unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, may I say it in English and not in um, Hebrew, or not Hebrew, but um, what's the word? Can't think of the language that the Jews spoke at that time, but he said, Daddy. Amen. Daddy. He said, Daddy, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst thou not watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed and spake the same words. Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. I hope you understand what I'm reading. Prayed again, same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Your eyes are heavy tonight too. Amen. He found them asleep. Neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, sleep on now, take your rest. It's enough, the hour's come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you will speak to every heart in this place. Lord, I cannot speak, I cannot Minister, I cannot preach, Lord, with, your, with the message that you want unless you give me the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, we have all gathered. Some have come from America, uh, USA. Some have come from Venezuela. Some have come from Medellin and, and Cartagena and all these faraway places. And they've all come here to a place Please speak to them now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Now, I started reading the text, and it says, and they came to a place. And then, as I was praying just now, you, I, I, I suppose you heard me saying those same words again that we have all gathered here We've all come to this place, amen. Now you came from far away and you pointed your car or your bus or some an airplane and you, you were trying to get here. But that's even, or that's not even the accurate way that it works. Yes, you're not here by accident. You wanted to be here. But I'm telling you that God prepared this place among all other places from millions of years in eternity. God has always planned to bring you and me to this special place. Amen. Now, the passage that I've just read, it has a context. 
Will you read just above here and you will understand that they were in the upper room and they were celebrating the Passover. And, and as I said a moment ago, uh, we have all eaten so well here. And then when it gets late in the evening and we're sitting in our chairs, our eyes get heavy. And just like the disciples, if we're not careful, we'll go to sleep. Amen. That's what happened to them. I hope it doesn't happen to you. Amen. But even before that, if you'll remember, it wasn't but a few days before this event, amen, that Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And the disciples said, well, some say Jeremiah, and some say the prophet, and some say Elijah, and mm, everybody's got a different idea. But Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? How many of you remember who responded and who answered? Saint Peter, yes, amen. I call him Saint Peter because he was really not a saint at all, amen. He was too much like me and too much like you. But Peter did answer and he spoke by the anointing of the Holy Ghost and he spoke from the, almost from the lips of God and he said, you are the Christ. You are the one that has been anointed from all eternity to come and to bring salvation to all of us. Amen. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, God has revealed this to you. I know, I know. I'm in touch with the Lord. Amen. That's probably what Peter was thinking but it was very quickly after that that Jesus said, it's time for me to go. I've got to go to a place. And when I get to that place, I will be taken and arrested and I will be mistreated and beaten and spit upon and I will be crucified and no, no, Jesus, no, we won't have it. I won't allow it. I won't let them do it to you. And so then, shortly after Jesus says, God spoke through you, Jesus now has to say, the devil is speaking through you. Amen. Get behind me, Satan. I tell you all of that to bring you. They are coming to a place. Amen. You have come to a place. I have come to a place. All of our lives God is working to bring us to a place, amen. Now all of those things happened and then they eat the Passover, they sing a hymn and they go out into the dark of the night. And as they, Jesus leads his disciples out the eastern side of the city of Jerusalem and they turn and go down the hill northward, down, 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 down and make their way has anyone ever visited Israel? Anybody ever been to the land of Israel? Look at some pictures of the city of Jerusalem. They went way down, 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 and then they crossed over the brook Cedron, and then they turn back northward, and they start to go up, 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 but they don't go very far before Jesus turns left and he enters into a little place, the Garden of Gethsemane. It was not a surprise. It was not unusual. The Garden of Gethsemane was a place that they went frequently. Jesus often took his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. I don't think they were angry. I don't think they said, oh, but Jesus, it's late, let's go home. I don't know where their home was. I don't know where they would have gone. They were probably accustomed sometimes to even sleeping in an open place like the Garden of Gethsemane. And so they go in, they came to the place, amen. Can I tell you that you and I often in our lives, we don't really know where it is we're going. You may want to go to Venezuela. You may want to go to Bucaramanga. You may want to go to Medellin. You may want to go to many places, but you don't really know where your life 
where your ministry, where your calling is going to end up someday. But God does. And he is trying to bring you and me. Come, come with me. Come, follow me closely. I want to bring you to a place. Amen. And so they ended up in the garden of Gethsemane. It was late. The disciples were tired. They'd just eaten. And I'm sure that as they settled down, yes, okay, Jesus, okay, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll pray. Oh, dear Lord in heaven, help us. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus, we, or, or Father, we need you. And one by one by one, they all began to fall asleep. Jesus is praying alone. They have been there before, but on this night, above all other nights, they had no idea what Jesus was carrying on his shoulders. As they went into that garden and Jesus prayed, he knelt down and he began to speak to his Father in heaven and they were sleeping away. When I was a little boy, I remember my mother had a friend, a lady in our same little town. And one day, or many days, we went to visit. And my mother was a new, 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 new believer in the Lord. And, and, and so she would go and visit this lady. And this lady would read with her from the Bible and teach her some things from the Bible. And they would pray together. But I remember that this lady had a picture, a, paint, a copy of a painting on her wall. It's a very famous painting. It's a, a painting of Jesus. Maybe you've seen it before. And it's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and it's like here is a stone, a large, large stone. And Jesus kneels down so carefully. And in the picture, he's all orderly. And every his robes are flowing. And he's got his hands extended out onto the stone and he's got his eyes lifted upward. It's, he looks so peaceful. He looks so beautiful in that photo. He's praying. He's in the Garden of Eden. But I want you to know tonight that that is not what it really looked like in the Garden of Eden. Amen. They show him so neatly, so carefully posed, ready to enjoy a few minutes or hour of prayer. But that's not the real circumstances that happened on that night. If you and I could go to the Garden of Gethsemane, we would see not a neatly, carefully posed Jesus going to pray peacefully to his Father, but we would see a man who was in agony of his soul a man who was trembling and shaking as he faced what was before him. A man that was under such pressure, that he was under such pain, such, uh, such agony of the night th that he was in that the little capillaries, the little tiny blood vessels underneath his skin began, they were under such pressure and tension that they began to burst and tear open and the blood would flow over into the little microscopic uh, 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 pores where the sweat would come out. And as he was agonizing and praying, and oh God, have mercy, help me God, oh please. That sweat and that blood was coming out of the pores of his body. He was not sitting, kneeling carefully, but I believe he was probably laying on the ground, rolling on the ground, and his fingers were clawing and gripping the dirt, and he was saying, oh God, if it does not have to be this way, please take this cup away from me. Jesus was in, under such pain and agony of spirit that night, and with all of that sweat and blood and the dirtiness and his clothes rumpled up as he rolled and he writhed in agony of prayer, that probably when he went back and shook those disciples and uh, they opened their eyes and they came awake, they had to look two times to even recognize this is Jesus, this is the master. He doesn't look like he normally looks. And yet still, 
they went right back to sleep. And Jesus went and he prayed. He prayed twice. He prayed three times. And he said the same words in his prayer. Brothers and sisters, tonight, I told you these men came to a place. I want you to know tonight, and I'm speaking to all of us, but particularly from the aspect and from the perspective that God might be calling many of you to be missionaries and workers in the kingdom of God. I want you to know that this chapter right here is where Calvary was won. It is where the powerful resurrection took place was right here in the Garden of Gethsemane. I know, I know, he was crucified somewhere else, and I know he was put in a tomb somewhere else, and he rose. But I'm saying spiritually, the victory was won in this Garden of Gethsemane. Hallelujah. It's strange when you go to Israel and you say, I want to see Calvary. I want to see uh, Golgotha. I want to see where Jesus died. Well, the Catholics, they will take you here and show you this place. And then others will take you over here and show you this place. And they both say, it was here. It was here that Jesus died. Nobody knows where he died. If you say, I want to see the tomb, I want to see where Jesus rose from the dead, some will take you here to a little garden tomb and it's empty, but others will take you over here to another big Catholic church and say, it was right here. Here is where he rose from the dead. Praise the Lord. But nobody knows. But we can be almost certain where Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane because the same 2,000-year-old olive trees are still right where they were in the Bible days. Amen. All I'm trying to tell you is wherever your Calvary comes in life and in ministry is not important. Wherever it will be that God will send his power and resurrect your soul and you will see the greatest victories in all of your ministry, wherever that is, that's not important. None of those things will ever happen like God wants them to unless you first of all come to a place called Gethsemane, amen. Can I tell you tonight, my dear friends, amen, that surrender this Gethsemane, this place of coming to surrender before God is the most important thing and experience in your life after Jesus has saved you. Hallelujah. You can be a child of God. You can live happy in the kingdom of the Lord. You can even hear God's voice and calling. He's speaking to you. Maybe this week, and he's saying, go, go to China, go to Korea, go to Asia, go to Africa, go to North America, South America, go wherever it may be in this world. And I hope you hear that voice tonight. But even if you hear the voice, and even if you go and you preach, I'm sure you will probably do some good in that place that you go to but you will never see the power and the work of the master Jesus Christ in your life, in your ministry, and your calling unless you have first of all won the battle in the place of surrender in that garden of Gethsemane in your life or in mine. Hallelujah. Friend, I don't know where your Gethsemane will be, but I can tell you tonight, amen, the easiest place to ever go through Gethsemane would be right here around these altars. Amen. In a place where we love you. In a place where we will put our hands and our arms around you. And we will say pray on brother. Pray on sister. We will call out and say God help them to make their surrender. If you don't make it in a place like this you may go on, you may go on to the place of your calling. You may go to your place of ministry, 
You can find a Gethsemane there, but there's no need to wait for another place. It would be so much better, amen, that when the Lord leads us today to a place of surrender, that we immediately say, God, here I am. Lord, touch me, change me. Work in my heart and in my life. Praise the Lord. I like the Apostle Paul because he was such a brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, a preacher, brilliant man. He knew all, so many things, amen, that we missionaries have to try to learn. He knew the importance of cross-cultural communications, amen. How many of you know cross-cultural communications? How many of you understand it completely? I'm not going to say I do because I come to Colombia and I even speak Spanish. And I sit down and I talk to people blah, 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 and they talk to me blah, 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 blah. and I walk away sometimes. I understood every word, every word, but I have no idea what they were really meaning and what they were really trying to say. India, my dear brother Thomas, I love you. Amen. I love you, brother. Praise the Lord. I love your country. I love your people. But I'm going to be honest. India is a difficult place to work. <laughs> Amen. I, Pastor, they speak English, don't they? Yes. Or at, at least I think they're speaking English. I mean, I hear the words and I know what those words mean. But we can talk, 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 talk. And after one hour... I'm thinking, I don't really know what they're trying to say. And I don't think they understand what I'm trying to say either. Paul knew how important it was to think in the mind of the other person. He knew what it was to not just go and bless God, preach the gospel, but he knew how to pray and seek God until God gave him what we call bridges, amen. Ways to reach into their culture, to reach into their thinking and find a connection that will help them understand what the gospel message is all about. Paul knew all of that. Paul was good. He was a great missionary. But you may even learn more than Paul but you will never see the true power of God in your life and the place of your calling until you have stopped and gone to Gethsemane. Hallelujah. Gethsemane. It's a beautiful garden, but it's an ugly place because it is where every fiber of your soul and spirit must be broken and torn and ground together, or you will never receive what God has for you and for me. Praise the Lord. In that hour of indescribable pain and agony, Jesus was experiencing what every person especially ministers, missionaries, whatever you are, every one of us must experience the same thing. I tell you that Jesus was the greatest and the first missionary because he was the first one, hey amen, the greatest one who knew and understood what it was to leave everybody you love at home. Say farewell to your dear beloved family, Father, amen. He knew what it was to go into a world where the culture was totally different. He, he, he understood because he was God, but humanly speaking, nobody ever truly understood him. And that's how a missionary often feels is, I'm trying, Lord, I'm praying, I'm working, I'm studying, I'm, I'm learning the language, I'm teaching, I'm preaching. And yet, I don't think they really are getting the message in their hearts and their minds. And he also knew what it was to go to a place because his father had sent them to that, him to that place. And yet, the people really did not want him to be there. Amen. Yankee, go home. 
Yankee go home, or Paisa go home. <laughs> I don't know how, how to say that in, in, in Colombiano, amen. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this world will never truly understand what God is calling you and me to do. They may appreciate it. Some of them will be grateful. Some of them will say thank you and some will come to know Jesus and they will get close to understanding what your calling is all about. But for the most part, even the dear brothers and sisters oftentimes step back and look at us from afar and they say, those missionaries are strange people. Amen. Jesus knew what it was to come to his own and they wouldn't receive him. They didn't even want him to be there. Go home, go home, go home. And they tried to help dispatch him and send him home. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brothers and sisters today, can I tell you that if we could listen closely to heaven, I think this evening we would hear one single word being shouted from the gates of heaven down to us, and that is that one word of surrender. Surrender, surrender, surrender! That's what I'm trying to preach to you about. That's why I'm trying to tell you about Gethsemane, is that's all Gethsemane is. It's a place for you and me to wrestle and fight and struggle and say, oh God, help me to surrender. When I was a little boy, I was very cruel. My wife, my wife doesn't like these stories, but I'm going to tell you this story anyway, amen. I was very cruel. In America, we have a little animal, usually about this big, gray, dark gray color, has a long, 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 fluffy, fluffy tail, like a big cat tail, and it has a gray ring and a black ring and a gray ring and a black ring, and he has a black mask over his eyes. He's the raccoon, amen. I don't know how to translate raccoon. Do it yourself, amen. This little raccoon, though, has these little bitty long, skinny fingers. And sometimes as a boy, you know, us boys, we wanted to try to catch a raccoon, but you can't catch them, they're hard to catch. But there's one way you can catch a raccoon. You can go find where a big, big, big tree has fallen over a creek or over a, a river of water, walk out there and make sure that the raccoons are crossing in this point, and you can take a drill and you can drill, 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 drill a hole about that big around, down deep into the log, and then take a real shiny coin and drop it in the bottom, and then take little nails and and you drill or you drive little nails like this at an angle. And that coin is down underneath the nails. And when that raccoon comes by and he smells, he looks in the hole and he sees that bright, shiny, the moonlight is shining on that coin. And he says, Whoo, hoo, hoo, I want that coin. Amen. And that raccoon will run his little skinny fingers down, 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 down. And he will grip that coin. But then when he pulls his hand up, those nails are catching him and he cannot get out. He's caught. The next morning when you go, you can probably find that raccoon on that log waiting for you. Do you know why that raccoon is caught? His little hand went in. Why won't it come out? Because he is holding so tightly to that coin that he can't get that big fist out of the hole. And the next day when you come and hit him in the head and then you skin him and you make a little hat with a long tail out of that raccoon skin and then you can say, I'm a real man now. It's all because that little animal would not let go of a simple, silly, foolish little coin. And that's where we have 
come to tonight. I believe with all of my heart that the Spirit of the Lord has been here yesterday and today and God is speaking and I believe that the Holy Spirit is touching hearts and trying to call people to follow me. And some, and some of us are coming to the altar or kneeling in our chairs and we're struggling and we say, God, why, why? Can't I feel liberty? Why can't I feel victory? And it's because we're not willing to surrender what we are gripping and holding so tightly to in this life of yours and mine. For my wife's sake, how many of you want to rescue that little raccoon? Yes? Let's rescue him. Let's not kill him. Let's not make a hat out of that poor little animal. We can whisper in his ear. No, he won't listen to you. <laughs> but if he would simply open his hand, let go his little hand would come out of that trap he could go on and live happily ever after but as long as he's gripping and holding and refusing to surrender he will never be free and some of you tonight not with your hand but with your heart some of you are gripping and holding on to some things in your life and you're saying, no, no, Lord, no, please, not this, not that, anything else, but not that. And God is saying, let go, let go. If you would just let go, you could be free. You could feel my presence. You could enjoy my power and my anointing flowing through your heart and your life. And I could let you go. And you and me together could do anything. Hallelujah. But as long as we're still there and we're still holding on. Now, I know some of you are already thinking, ha, Pastor Carlos, he's talking about me holding on to my job. Yes, 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 maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'm talking about you holding on to your, the approval of all your friends who want you to just stay here and make money and get a good job and have a nice big house. And maybe you need to let go of their approval and their opinion. And you need to do what God at this altar is speaking to your heart to do. Can I turn it around, Pastor? There might even... I th I don't like saying this because I'm a missionary. I want everybody to be missionaries. But I'm gonna say it because I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart while I was sitting here tonight. Some of you might be holding on to the dream of I wanna go be a missionary far away and I just wanna lose myself in another culture and I wanna do God's will. And I, you really love God. You really want to serve him. I'm happy. Praise the Lord. That's good. But it might be in your case that maybe God really has a place here at home. And God is saying, yes, you could go there and do good. But if you would stay here and let my dream become your dream you could do a thousand times more right here than you could ever do over there. Brothers and sisters, the Lord tonight wants to speak to us and call us. I need to hurry. I probably need to quit. Amen. Let me just tell you something. Two experiences personal one. I wish this conference was in Spanish. I would rather tell the story in Spanish because I don't want any of my American friends to find this video on the internet and listen to it. 
I'm ashamed. I am ashamed of what I'm about to tell you. But perhaps it will help you. More than 30 years ago, my wife and I were young. We were newly married. We'd only been married about three years, four, four years at that point. God opened a door of ministry for us. We went far away from our home, and we were, to, we were working in a local church. We, uh, I'm trying to be careful so that I don't reveal details that might hurt somebody somewhere. So please understand. We were working in ministry, but a special kind of ministry in a local church. And as often happens with young people who are excited, but not wise sometimes, there were some chokes, there were some uh, problems in that local church because of the way that I was doing many of just some of the things in, our, in that ministry. There came a day when the pastor and several men, what it was, it was some parents of little children that we were working with. Some of the parents were unhappy that we were uh, just the way we did some, of, uh, some things. And so the parents called the pastor and the poor pastor. He had pressure, pressure, pressure from the parents. And, and he, he, he didn't want to hurt us. He didn't want to do anything wrong to us. But he, came, he called the meeting. We came. Well, this is 30 years ago. No cell phones, no iPhones, no Androids, nothing. Just one of those old, 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 old cassette tape players. Do you remember the old cassettes? Only the old people said, I'm in. This was a special one. This was a miniature cassette. It was only this long, this wide, and that thick. And it fit right here in your pocket. It, was, it worked as well as a cell phone. In the meeting, and I'm, I'm, confessing, I'm confessing my errors, please forgive me. I went to that meeting and I told my wife, I said, mm-hmm, there could be some problems in this meeting. We better be careful. I'm going to record the conversation so that nobody can change my words later and get me in trouble. I'm sorry, I'm just confessing, please forgive me. I went to the meeting, kept it in my pocket. I even asked the brethren, and they said, yes, 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 you can record it. So I wasn't, shh, I wasn't trying to be secret. Time went by, praise the Lord. We, we moved, we went to another place and continued the work. And then after just about four more years, we went to Venezuela and we were missionaries in Venezuela. A long time passed. But before we went to Venezuela, about three years after leaving that place, one day, Pastor Thomas, I was just cleaning, cleaning. My wife likes it when I clean. I was cleaning up some of my papers and things and I found that little cassette tape. I couldn't remember everything that was on there. So I, took, I found that old recorder, I put new batteries in it, I put the cassette in there, I went outside. And I sat in my car and I pushed the button and I thought, I need to listen to this. And we, I began to listen, listen, listen. And I heard Brother Fulano and I heard other Brother Fulano and the other Brother Fulano and I heard Pastor Fulano and, and I heard me and them and me and them. And, and before it finished, the Lord touched my heart, Brother Mejia. And he said, Carlos, why? Why do you need that? I said, but, 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 because, uh, but Lord, there's legal problems. You never know what could happen in ministry. And the Lord said, Carlos, you don't need that. But, 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 but I need to keep it. You never know. Anything could happen. And the Lord said, Carlos, I told you, you don't need that anymore. I took it out and... Uh, you're right. I really don't need this, probably. I pulled the tape out, threw it away. Do you know what happened? When I listened to it, all of those old feelings, all of the anger, all of the bitterness, 
All of the mistakes and errors of my thinking started coming back and back and back. And I remembered this one and that one and the other one and what he said and what he said and how it worked out and what happened. And, but as soon as the Lord convinced me that I didn't need it any longer, Pastor, I took it out, I threw it away. <gasps> And it was like I could breathe better. It was like my feet were lighter. I wasn't... Uh, 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 uh. That's been 30 years ago. That pastor's still alive. He's an older, older man now. He has terrible health problems. But that pastor, if I were to call him on the phone today and say, Pastor, I'm in trouble I need your help. Can you please help me? I think that man in his poverty, I think he would give me everything he could to help me. He loves me and I love him. But if I would have kept holding on to those foolish, bitter memories, I would have never known the joy and love and fellowship between me and that pastor. Please, my friends, open your hands. Let it go. Surrender. Gethsemane. Surrender. And you can find help. And you can find victory. Praise the Lord. Last thing, and I'm, I should quit. I'm sorry. Last story. Many years, the, the church where Sister Kimberly and I attend when we are at home in America, many years ago, before we were married, there, uh, there was an old, 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 old man, missionary. Uh, he came, he was probably, I don't know, he was probably over more than 80 years old. And so to me, that was an old, 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 old man in those days. Now it's not so old. I'm getting closer but that old man came to our church. Sister Olga, you would have liked this man. He was a missionary, amen. That man came to, our, to that church where we attend now, and he preached, uh, and he told a story. When he was a missionary, I'm talking about in the 1930s, so 80, 85 years ago. He was a missionary in Africa, several places in Africa, but at that time, he and his wife were working in South Africa. And they, they had started a church. And one day in the prayer meeting, just the, the, the missionary's wife and the ladies of the church gathered for prayer meeting. And at the end of the prayer meeting, one sister raised her hand. She said, I have a prayer request. This sister always had the same, 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 same prayer request. She said, please pray that God will save my husband and my daughter. Okay, we will help you pray. And the missionary's wife suddenly felt the Holy Spirit touch her. And she said, sister, if we pray for God to save your wife or your, your daughter and your, and your husband, will you be able to pray whatever it takes Whatever it costs, please save them. And that sister was a good old-time Pentecostal woman who loved God. But she said this. She said, all these years that I have requested prayer, she said, I have never been able to honestly say, Lord, whatever it takes, please save my daughter and my husband. But she said, I am so desperate. It is so hopeless. There's so many problems that I think today I'm willing. God, whatever you have to do, please save my girl. Please save my husband. And don't let them die and go to hell. You'd have to understand this woman's husband, he had worked in the gold mines of South, uh, South Africa. There were, one day in the gold mines, there was a terrible explosion. <laughs> Literally, 
He had no eye inside of his sockets, nothing. It was gone. That explosion completely destroyed both eyes. He was totally blind. And that man was so angry and so bitter against God, he would curse his wife over and over and over and over. He was hateful to his wife. And then he would go outside in the back behind the house and he would lift his face up to the heavens with no eyes in his head. And he would curse God and he would shake his fist in God's face and he would say, go ahead, God, do anything you want to. I don't care. I'm not afraid of your hell. Do your worst, but I will curse you. That's the way that man was. Ooh, wicked, evil man. And then he would drink, drink, drink until he would just pass out totally. The girl, the daughter, had grown up in church, but when she got older, teenager, she left the Lord. She began to follow the ways of the world, and she began to run with other young people that were far, far, far from God. And the mother testified that her daughter had become even more hurtful than the husband was more hateful, more despising of mother and God and everything good. But that day, after the sister says, I am willing, whatever it takes, God save my girl and save my husband and don't let him die and go to hell. The sisters prayed together and they said, God, you hurt our sister. You, she said she's willing, whatever you have to do, have mercy and save her family. Six weeks went by. One day, her daughter went in a house, an old, this is long, 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 long time ago, had one of those old kerosene stoves that you have to pump up, and then you have to light it. Something happened. That kerosene exploded. That, that liquid gas went all over her. It burned her face, her hair, her head, her neck, her throat, her body, her back, her legs. 100% third-degree burns over her entire body. They rushed her to the hospital, but the hospital couldn't do anything for that poor young lady. But she lived five or six days in the most horrible agony you could ever dream of. But in those five or six days, she begged her mother to forgive her. She even begged her wicked father to forgive her. She called for the church people to come and she begged them, please forgive me for all I've done. And she begged God to have mercy on her she said, I know I cannot live, but if God will have mercy, I want him to save my soul and forgive me of my sins. That young girl got saved. Hallelujah. God worked in her heart and she died with the joy of the Lord in her heart. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, mother was happy that her daughter got saved. But now mother was worried, oh no. My husband was so evil before this happened. What will he do now? How bad will he get? Two days later, they gathered in the church, the little Pentecostal church there in South Africa where, they, where the wife, the mother attended. They brought the little casket, the box in there, and they set it up front, and the preacher preached a sermon, and then... Those that wanted to come up front passed by one last time to say farewell. That old, wicked, hateful, blind father came up to the casket. He fell on his knees in front of that casket. He couldn't see it, but he felt it. And, it, and he began to cry out and say, Oh God, if you could have mercy on a wicked devil-possessed man like me. I'm sorry, would you please forgive me of my sins, Lord? If you can find mercy for someone like me, please let me be your child. 
That man lived way up into his 80s. And they said that he would go out day and night in front of his house. He would turn his face to the heavens, no eyes, and he could still cry. And they said tears would flow down his cheeks as he would sing and he would pray and he would thank God for having mercy on a wicked sinner like himself. Where did that happen? How did that happen? Surrender. And I believe here tonight that the Spirit of God is knocking on your door saying, young lady, would you just surrender? Surrender your dreams, your hopes, all of your plans. Would you just surrender them to me and I can make your life far more beautiful than you could have ever dreamed. Young man, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, why don't you and me also surrender? Hallelujah. Jesus and his disciples came to a place. You, you and I, are his disciples, amen? amen? I think he has held our hand and led us to this place tonight. And now he's saying, surrender. Brother Thomas, God's used you mightily. God's blessed you wonderfully. God's done many special, wonderful, great things. Hallelujah. But if you've never been to Gethsemane, there is so much more to what he can do in your life and your ministry. Some of you are saying, no, 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 I can't let go. I don't want to let go. I don't want to let go. And God is saying, but you don't know how much greater your life and your effectiveness and your ministry can be if you would just turn loose and surrender and let me be the one to guide you and lead you and bring you to the place that I have planned for you. In the name of Jesus, would you stand this evening, church? Hallelujah. Dear Jesus, I ask you now for your mercy and help in this holy place. Father, speak to every single heart in the name of Jesus. There's men and women here, Lord. You, are, you have not called them to be missionaries. Some are pastors and some are fathers and mothers and workers and factories and jobs and businesses. And praise the Lord. Amen. You, you're trying to use them where they are. But Lord, lead them tonight to that place of surrender so that they could see a complete transformation in the rest of their life. But Lord, I believe there's also some people here tonight that you're trying to speak to them and call them. You have a special work, a special place, a special ministry. They need to be busy here, but there's even something more beyond this place. But Lord, they need to come to surrender. <laughs>